Good morning, or just a few minutes early before our 10 o'clock start time, uh, but I had a couple things I wanted to talk about uh, before we start our lesson today. First of all, I want to thank you for joining us today, and many of you have joined us each week, and we appreciate that so much and appreciate your comments and your support as we go through this difficult time of not being able to assemble together. I miss assembling with my brethren so much. Uh, I miss hearing the announcements about what's going on. Uh, I miss uh, the handshakes and the hugs, and I miss the comments in Bible class, and I miss the babies uh, crying and acting up during sermons. I, I just miss it all. And uh, so uh, I am ready for us to be able to assemble as a group again and look forward to that day and hope that you do too. Uh, before we begin our lesson today, uh, I did want to say just a couple things about the fact that today on our calendars uh, is called Easter Sunday. Uh, a lot of people throughout the world will be attending uh, uh, church services, and sometimes that's the only time, or maybe then in Christmas, that they do such. I want to say that uh, these, these uh, live streams are all about presenting truth from the Bible, and that's all that we want to do. And I don't recall reading in the Bible anywhere of a day or of a special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus that's mentioned anywhere in the pages of the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm thankful that people are thinking about the resurrection of Jesus today. But I'm also somewhat sorrowful that uh, some will only think about it today and that some will not uh, look at that blessed event in all of its glory uh, every day of their lives. This is something that all of us need to realize the uh, importance of. Um, a lot of people are surprised to learn that the word Easter is not in the Bible except in the King James Version of the Bible in one passage in Acts 12 and verse 4 you'll see the word Easter. Everywhere else in the King James Version Bible that uh, you see that same word translated, uh, it will not say Easter, it will say uh, Passover. And it's the word Pascha, like the Paschal Lamb. And so it's unfortunate that that word Easter was put in that one translation in just that one place. In Acts 12 and verse 4, it's talking about the fact that uh, Herod the king had killed James and he had put Peter in prison. And the, verse 4 reads that he intended after Pascha to bring him forth. And that word uh, is the word Passover. Everywhere else it's translated. So where did Easter come from if it didn't come from the Bible? Well, Easter translates an, an old uh, Anglo-Saxon word, Eoster, E-O-S-T-R-E, and Eoster was the goddess of the spring, and I suppose that's where we get uh, all of this uh, pomp and circumstance about uh, bunnies and eggs and all of that kind of thing. There, there is a whole other study on all of that, uh, but my point is that this does not come uh, from the Bible. Uh, the Bible didn't teach, Jesus didn't teach it, his apostles didn't teach uh, an annual celebration, any celebration other than our lives and our teaching uh, of the resurrection. And the early church did not celebrate such. So we will concern ourselves in these uh, live streams and in everything that we do. And again, I don't, rec I don't represent the Church of Christ meeting at Steele, and I certainly don't represent the Church of Christ universally. I can only re represent me, uh, but we will be presenting the Bible as truth and give uh, references, scripture references uh, for everything uh, that we present. So that's, that's going to be the purpose uh, of these. So today our study is entitled, Why Some Do Not Obey. This comes from 1 Peter chapter 4. If you'd like to pick up your a copy of God's Word, and take a look at that uh, with me. That would be best. First Peter chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. 
Uh, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, though some strange thing happened to you. Uh, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he's blasphemed, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So we're centering in on this thought given in verse 17. uh, What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now Peter in uh, in the context here is talking about Uh, the judgment that's going to come upon Christians, that is, uh, the trial that he he describes here that they're going to endure. But we also need to realize that there is a great judgment that is coming uh, as well, uh, and that is that final judgment in the end. So what will come of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Let me begin by saying this that Christians have a duty to get the message out, the message of salvation. And uh, I want to give that message of salvation and just a couple passages about our duty to get the message out as we begin. Uh, First of all, uh, the bad news is that we all are sinners, those of us who are old enough to know the difference from right and wrong. Uh, and we, we commit sin when we get to that age. And so uh, in order to be forgiven for our sins, we have to find Jesus. The Bible tells us that happens by uh, coming to hear of Jesus, John 6 and verse 45, by believing in him. In fact, Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. It comes by repenting and being baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. It comes by being willing to confess our faith in Jesus, believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10 and verse 10, and being baptized to be saved, Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus' words. This all falls under the category of what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 5 as being born again. All of us were born into this world, and that birth, led to us growing up and being entangled in sin. In order to make it to the next world, the heavenly realm, we have to be born again, this time by the Spirit, allowing the Spirit of God to influence us and following the Spirit and producing the fruit of the Spirit. Now, that being the case, we have the duty to get that message out, those who have been saved. In Matthew 28 and verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples, the King James says teach, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the world. So Jesus says, Go, make disciples, go and teach. It's your duty as saved people to go and teach. In Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, again, Jesus says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. People can't believe and be baptized unless they hear the message. They can do that uh, by listening to a live stream. They can do that by reading the Bible on their own. They can do that by listening to someone teach them the truth from the Bible, but they cannot obey until they hear and believe. So Jesus says to go and get that done. That's why we're making efforts like this this morning. And in Luke 19 verses 9 and 10 when Jesus 
uh, comes into town and there's this wee little man that climbs the sycamore tree. Uh, Jesus comes to him and he says to Zacchaeus, uh, salvation has come to this house. And then he makes this statement, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus' mission was to seek out people. Not Jesus didn't come to build a church and put a sign out front, a church building, and put a sign out front and, and then just say, well, people know what time we're here, they can come to us. No, that's not what he did. He came to seek and to save, and he tells us to go and to teach. So that is our duty. But now that being the case, as Christians... Uh, obey their duty and, and discharge their duty to go and teach and to preach the gospel, not everyone is going to be saved. And that, that's because some just simply will not obey the message that is being taught. I want to talk about some reasons why some will not obey. And the first reason is that some are not ready that's right. There are millions of people who have not obeyed the will of God, and that's exactly as it should be. Now, let me explain quickly before you try to pacify uh, your conscience too quickly. I'm talking about babies. I'm talking about small children. I'm talking about those who are still immature, and I'm also talking about those who are mentally incompetent of grasping the difference in right and wrong and being uh, accountable to an almighty God. Uh, they have not obeyed, and they should not obey, uh, because they can't obey. They are innocent. In, in Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, the prophet said in verse 4, the soul who sins shall die. The people that we're talking about in this category, they, they can't sin because they can't understand the difference in right and wrong. Uh, in Matthew chapter 18, the first three verses there, Jesus takes a small child up and he says, unless you become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we have to become like children. There are some uh, religions that teach that children are born in sin. Why would Jesus take a small child, uh, a sinner, and say you have to become like this? And the fact is he wouldn't. Children are innocent. They are incapable of committing sin. And, and so in John 6 and verse 45, one of the verses we had on one of our opening slides, uh, Jesus says, you have to hear and to learn that everyone uh, has to hear and to learn, be taught in order to come to him. The people that we're talking about in this category, they can't be taught yet. Uh, Mark 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. These people are incapable of believing as Jesus is talking about here. So uh, that's why we're saying uh, it's okay that they have not been saved. Now, let me tell you that there are some of, in this category who will never be capable, those who are mentally incompetent. But the, the rest of them, if the Lord allows them to live and all things being equal... One day they will be. In Hebrews 11, that great chapter of faith, in verse 24, it talks about Moses. And it says, Moses, when he was come to years, chose. He made a decision not to any longer be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but to join himself with God's people, the Hebrews. He understood, I have come to a crossroads I'm going to have to make a decision because I understand that these are God's people and that the Egyptians are not and they are idolaters. And he understood I'm at a crossroads and he chose when he got to that point. So these who are not ready, all things being equal, one day they will be ready and they must make a decision. Uh, also, those who are ignorant... Uh, do not obey. And I'm not using that word in any sense uh, to be derogatory. Ignorant, I'm using that in the sense of lacking knowledge. All of us are ignorant of something. I'm completely ignorant of brain surgery. Wouldn't know where to start. All of us are ignorant of something. Uh, many of us are ignorant of many things. 
but some are without knowledge in regard to the need to be saved, in regard to how to be saved. Uh, In regard to this, uh, let's just think about real quickly the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Follow along uh, in your Bible, and uh, I should have already had this up here and I didn't again. Uh, But uh, in Acts chapter 8, we're going to be talking about an Ethiopian nobleman. Uh, He's described as the Ethiopian eunuch. And we're going to look at God sending to him his preacher, Philip. And it says uh, in Acts 8 and verse 30, uh, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And if you keep uh, reading that passage, what you'll find is that uh, Philip preached Christ to him. And uh, as they went down the road, eventually he, he obviously talked about baptism. And the, and the, the Ethiopian asked, here's water, what uh, prevents me from being baptized? Uh, Philip took him down in the water, baptized him, and uh, he came up a new creature in Christ. So the Ethiopian didn't understand. He said, how can I unless some man guides me? And Philip guided him. Some have not obeyed the gospel because they simply don't have the knowledge. They don't know the need to be saved. They don't understand what sin is and that they have committed sin. They don't understand uh, if they do uh, realize they have sin. They don't know how to go about having that sin forgiven. Um, Many people, as I said, don't understand the concept of sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have people tell me all the time, I've never killed anybody. I don't talk bad about people. I don't steal from people. I'm in business. I'm honest. I don't cheat. And they just, they don't see the need. They don't think that they are bad people and that they don't don't have a need to be forgiven of anything. But here's the thing. People don't understand that sin is against God. When you go back and read Acts chapter 5 and the example of Ananias and Sapphira, who withheld something from their contribution under the pretense that they gave all, what did Peter charge them with? He said, you haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. Now... That's the concept we need to get in our minds. It's not against men, it's against God. When David was uh, unfaithful, he, he committed fornication with Bathsheba. Uh, he, so he involved her in that. Uh, he involved the captain of his army in, in coming up with this diabolical plot to put a man in the front line and withdraw from him. He killed, he was responsible for the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And, and yet... When you look at his psalms of penitence, like Psalm 51, for example, he says, against you, you only have I sinned, O God. He understood that sin is against God. Some people don't understand that. They think that if they do things, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty good people, then they're fine. Well, we have to understand sin is against God. When we fail to do what God tells us to do, when we do things that God tells us not to do, or when we violate our conscience, we sin against God, and we need forgiven of that. What are the consequences? Some people don't understand the consequences. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, people tell me all the time, I just don't see how a good, loving God that created this world and all the good things in it would send people to eternal torment in hell. The Bible tells us God has no choice in the matter because His character is such that He is righteous, that He is good, He does all things well. He must give the proper punishment for the crime. What would you think? about a judge in a a civil court, for example, uh, that just says, uh, well, I've looked at your case here and you're guilty, but, uh, you know, I'm just feeling good today, so I'm just going to say, go on your way. What would you think about that if that person was guilty of doing something hideous against you or your family? What would you think about that? That's not just, is it? God is just and righteous. 
He has no choice but to be just and righteous. That's his nature, his character. And so he has to carry out that sentence. Uh, some people are ignorant of the fact that they don't know what is required of them now that they've discovered that they are sinners. And so they must uh, have someone guide them in regard to faith in Jesus and obedience to his will. So that's why some have not obeyed. Could that be the case with you? And if you don't know, would you be so kind as to get with us so that we can talk to you more about what you need to do in order to recognize your sin and come to Jesus to take care of your sin problem? Some have not obeyed and do not obey because they don't understand the importance of obedience. Felix is one of these. Look over at Acts chapter 24, and we're going to begin... Uh, in verse 22, Acts 24 and verse 22. Now, Felix was a a Roman governor of the area of Judea. And and Paul went before Felix at Caesarea. Uh, This was shortly before he would eventually go to Rome uh, for trial. And in Acts uh, 24 and verse 22, it says, uh, after all these people made all these disparaging remarks against Paul, things that couldn't be founded, by the way, When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, that's the way of Christianity, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case, that is, Paul's case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse uh, 25. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Felix was an unscrupulous ruler, by the way. He had three wives. He had a a secret guard called the Sicari that uh, he would just do whatever he said, assassinate people or do whatever he said, and he thought he could pretty much get away with anything. And he knew about Christianity, but he didn't know all there was to it. He didn't realize how important the message of Christianity was, and Paul got down to brass tacks with him. And what, is, what did it say he talked about? He talked about uh, self uh, righteousness. He talked about righteousness to a judge, to a ruler. Rulers have to do right. He talked about self-control. This man had three wives. He, he, he would assassinate people uh, on a whim. Uh, and he talked about the judgment to come. He said, just like people come before you for judgment, Felix, you're going to go before the God of all the world and you're going to be judged as well. And when that important message got to him, then he got scared. In fact, the King James Version says that he trembled. We should all tremble at the fact that we will be judged before the God of heaven. So it took more explanation to make him see the full import of the gospel. And he became afraid, but as far as we know, he didn't get scared enough because we don't read about him uh, obeying the gospel. Is that the case with you? Do you not realize how important the message of the gospel is? Still others do not understand the urgency of the gospel message, and that's why they've not obeyed. Now you say, now wait a minute, John, you just talked about importance. Isn't that the same thing as urgency? No, it's not. And that's the reason that I have this little uh, photo of this gal in the airplane. Now, if you've ridden on the airplane, you know that before you take off, while you're on the ground, she gets up there, and she has this little mask, and she pulls the band over her head and shows you how to do that, and she tells you that in the event that Uh, there's a lack of oxygen or cabin pressure, Uh, these will fall down and and you put them over your mouth and even though the bag doesn't inflate, oxygen will be flowing and put the bag on you first and then try to help other people. That's important information, but if you're in that plane and all of a sudden the environment changes and those things drop down, now it's not just important that you have that information, it's what? It's urgent. That's the difference in importance and urgency. And some people understand that Christianity is important, but they don't understand that it's urgent. Now, that's a message that Saul heard from Ananias 
uh, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Here you have Saul, and he has uh, been traveling on the road to Damascus. He saw this great light, and it blinded him. He's now been led into the city by the hand because he can't see, and he's been praying for three days. Meanwhile, God is getting Ananias ready to uh, send to him as his preacher. By the way, every, every time I hear these messages by preachers on TV in different places, they, they give you a prayer that you need to pray to be saved. Don't you think if anybody could be saved by saying a prayer, it would have been Saul of Tarsus? He spent three days down on his knees praying, and yet when Ananias comes to him in, in Acts 22 and verse 16, he says to him, now why are you waiting around? Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This man who had been fasting and praying, he was obviously penitent. He obviously believed in God. He was willing to confess the name of Jesus. And he prayed and prayed and prayed for three days, but he had to be baptized. And Ananias said it was urgent. Why are you waiting? Incidentally, as I said, I, I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't know Greek but I can look at an interpretation uh, of the Scriptures and see what this Greek word is and how it's interpreted in English. And the word for waiting, why are you waiting, in Acts 22 and verse 16, in Greek is the word mellow. found that interesting. Because you and I, we use the English word mellow, you mean, to, to take it easy. Uh, as the young people say, chill out. Just don't get excited. Relax. Well, basically, Ananias said, Saul, this is not a time to relax. This is not a time to chill out. This is a time to get up and take care of business. It's urgent. Is that the case with you? Do you understand the need to obey the gospel, but it hasn't become urgent for you? Folks, the Lord's going to come again, and we're going to die. There's no stopping either one of those events. It is urgent. Don't wait. All you have is today. Still others don't, have not obeyed because they feel, I'm not worthy. And let me just say that uh, that's not a bad thing. All of us should come to that feeling that we're not worthy. But the thing is, we need to not let that feeling stop us from going to Jesus. The Pharisees certainly felt uh, some were not worthy. In fact, in, in, fact, in Matthew chapter 9, in verses 10 through 13, uh, Jesus had gone to the, the home of a of, of Pharisee, and he, the Pharisees looked that, uh, that Jesus was spending his time with sinners and tax collectors, and they, they wondered about that. And Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He says, I'm here to surround myself with sinners. I'm here to get in the middle of sinners. I'm here to save sinners. So where else would you expect Jesus to be? John the Baptist understood that he was not worthy. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse 27, he says, It is he who is coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. John says, I'm not worthy of Christ. I know that, but it didn't keep John from getting out and spreading the message. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He got the message out that Jesus is here, the Messiah. Go to him and listen to him. The fact that he was unworthy didn't keep him from acting. This is what I refer to sometimes as paralysis by analysis. We analyze the fact so much that Jesus is righteous and our sins make us so unworthy that we just fail to act. We say it's so bad, and we just don't act. It did not prevent John the Baptist. Uh, and what we need to realize is what James says in James 4 and verse 6, which by the way, this is a quote from Proverbs 3 and verse 34. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if you feel like you're not worthy, you're on the right track. Because God's looking for humble people. He wants you to humble yourself. He's looking for people wh whose knees are worn out on their jeans, not the, whose soles of their feet are worn out from standing up and sticking their chest out. He wants you to humble, and He will save you if you'll humble yourself. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, there is a centurion, and he has a servant who is sick. 
And he goes to Jesus to see about healing his sick servant. Jesus says, okay, I'll go do it. And listen to his reaction, Matthew 8, verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now here's a man who understood he wasn't worthy, but didn't keep him from going to Jesus to get what he needed. In fact, the only one anywhere who could give him what he needed. He still went even though he wasn't worthy and he didn't let that stop him from getting what Jesus could provide. Some have not obeyed the gospel because they are afraid to commit to Jesus. Now, in Acts 26 verses 27 and 28, Jesus is now, or pardon me, Paul is now before uh, Agrippa. He went before Felix, then he went before Festus. He's now before Agrippa. This is uh, Herod Agrippa II, who was a ruler of uh, a portion of the area of Galilee. So in Acts 26 and, and uh, verses 27 and 28, uh, Paul asked, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Here's one who sees the need, but is unwilling to commit. Now let me tell you, Jesus expects us to consider what we're doing. He doesn't, I remember when I was a kid, sometimes uh, teenagers, somebody would get up during a service and decide they're going to obey the gospel, and one or two of their friends would do the same thing. They would question themselves later and say, did I really do it because I'm committed to the Lord, or because I just wanted to get on the bandwagon? Uh, and so we... We have to. Jesus implores us, look down the road and see the cost of discipleship. Luke chapter 9, and beginning in verse 57. Uh, some said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He goes on later to say, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So he, Jesus wants us to look down the road. He wants us to know the cost of discipleship, but then He wants us to go ahead and give Him our total commitment. You know, they say that's the difference in, uh, in a uh, uh, bacon and egg breakfast. Uh, the chicken gives a little bit, but the pig makes a total commitment. Now, now God is looking for those who will give a total commitment, give their whole lives to Him. And He wants us to look down the road and see what that means and look at the long term, not just the short term. Is it the case with you? Or are you afraid to commit? And the last point I want you to think about is that some do not want to obey. Now, do these folks understand uh, that uh, they're ready? Yes, they do. Do they uh, know the need? Do they know how to obey? Yes, they do. Do they understand the importance and the urgency of obeying? Yes, they do. Are, are they letting the fact that they're not worthy uh, or, or a total commitment, is that holding them back? No, that's not what it is. They just don't want to. They love the flesh more than they love heaven. In fact, I was looking this morning, there's a quote, be glad to get this to you. Uh, there was a man named Aldous Huxley who was a, a, a professed atheist who, who did lots of books and debates and things. He lived from 1894 to 1963. And interestingly enough, he died on the same day that C.S. Lewis died, who was a great apologist for the Christian faith. And it, that is also the day that uh, JFK died. But uh, Huxley made this admission about being an atheist. I had motive for not wanting the world to have meaning, consequently assumed that it had none, and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. He went on to say, for myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation sexually and politically. You know what he said? I'm not, I'm not saying there's any good proof for being atheist. I'm just saying I don't want to serve God. I want to do what I want to do. Now, if that is you, I want you to think about two passages with me 
uh, before we end. Proverbs 17 and verse 11. Proverbs 17 and verse 11. An evil man seeks only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Now, in the Septuagint, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, instead of saying a cruel messenger, it says a pitiless angel. Again, God has no choice in this matter. If one is obstinate and persists in sin, God is duty-bound to stand by his character and to judge righteously that one. But what a frightening thought. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and beginning in verse 7, Paul says, To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Who's going to be punished with everlasting destruction? Those who do not know God, do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know some reasons why some will not obey and some just don't want to, but shouldn't this make us want to? Because there is terrible vengeance going to be meted out against those who do not obey the gospel. If you have not obeyed the gospel, why? Is it for one of the reasons that we've talked about today? You're not ready, you're afraid to commit, you're not worthy, uh, you're ignorant, you're, you're not seeing the urgency in this, it's not important to you, or is it just that you don't want to? Because we've seen that none of these are good reasons, except for those who are not yet ready. But again, ask yourself that question every day. We're trying to present truth from the Bible. If you've seen something that you don't think is right, you have further questions about it, you just want to discuss it more, you want to debate it, uh, if there's anything that's a loose end for you, please get with us. Comment now on Facebook. Uh, send us an email, steelchurchofchrist at gmail.com. Uh, call or text us, 573-695-3323 for the office phone. And my personal uh, cell phone number, 870-623-5339. Text me, uh, call me, get with me, and let's open our Bibles and let's find the truth together. May God bless you on your journey toward God and toward our final destination in heaven. Thank you.